Markets are bracing for big speeches from the Fed and the ECB at Jackson Hole tonight. Stocks are down a bit and bond yields are nudging higher on some niggling fears that more rate hikes might be needed, or at least some tough talk about more rate hikes. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive, we take a much closer look under the hood of China's property market downturn. And now is the time, seems to me, the time to pay back. <laughs> and uh, when the government started to deleverage this sector and to downplay the importance to economic growth, then we are seeing you know, the increasing number of defaults. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, number one, US stocks are down about 1% this morning and US bond yields are up around 3 to 5 basis points. That's on a few jitters ahead of these monetary policy speeches tonight from the biggest corporate offsite in central banking globally. That's the symposium at Jackson Hole in Wyoming in the United States. ANZ's head of G3 Economics, Brian Martin, points out there's been some relatively hawkish speeches last night from current and former members of the FOMC, that's the Fed's policy-making committee. Essentially, they said the Fed had more work to do because of re-acceleration in growth, which could add up to inflationary pressures. Number two, there was also a collection of secondary data from the United States overnight that pushed back against the very weak noises that came out of the global PMIs on Wednesday night. Brian points to data out showing a rebound in the Kansas City Fed's manufacturing index and a bounce in the Chicago Fed's national activity index. There was also a slight fall in US jobless claims. He says these data points don't suggest the world's largest economy is teetering on the brink of recession and really are a sharp contrast with the downbeat flash PMIs for August. Number three, the Bank of Korea held its policy rate yesterday, but with a hawkish bias. Here's ANZ's Asia economist Crystal Tan talking last night from Singapore with my colleague Catherine Dyer. So the governor reiterated that the board is considering the need for a further rate hike as opposed to potential rate cuts. It is uncertainty about US Fed policy, above target domestic inflation, and also a recent resurgence in household borrowings that are keeping the Bank of Korea guarded. But at the same time, economic outlook there is weak. So the hurdle for an actual rate hike is also quite high. So on balance, we think the Bank of Korea will keep its policy rate on hold for the rest of 2023. Number four, China's President Xi Jinping called on the BRICS countries to use the renminbi more instead of the US dollar. And the BRICS announced plans for a major expansion, adding Saudi Arabia, Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, and the UAE from January the 1st. This enlarged grouping would see the BRICS plus plus have almost half of the world's population and just over a third of global GDP on a purchasing power parity basis. Number five, one player to watch in the BRICS is Iran, which is coming out of its shell with a range of diplomatic initiatives that's allowing it to increase oil exports. That's pushing down on oil prices. Here's ANZ's senior commodity strategist, Daniel Hines. We've actually seen, according to ship tracking data uh, that you can obtain uh, through Bloomberg, for example, that there's been actually a steady increase in in exports um, out of Iran. As I said, uh, you know they've been virtually zero from about 2020, but uh, last year, uh, according to that data, um, it had crept up, and, and in fact, uh, just over the past few months, we've seen it rise to about 1.5 million barrels a day. So not far off. You know, the levels that we saw under the, the 2015 uh, Iran nuclear deal. ANZ's Daniel Hines there. Now, in our bonus deep dive, let's take a closer look at the growing problems with defaults in China's property development and shadow banking sectors. ANZ's Chief Economist for Greater China, Raymond Jung, has just done a big piece of research into the potential macroeconomic effects. We've seen that the problem continue to worsen because of the overall downturn of property demand, which means that um, the property projects can no longer uh, have sufficient cash to cover the financial obligation, including the payment requirement 
to fund their payment obligation to uh, wealth management product uh, raised by the trust sector in China, which is a very important, used to be a very important uh, shadow banking sector in China in varieties of investment projects. Residential investment is one of them, infrastructures and many other domestic developments also have some funding originate from wealth management products. So I think that's the, uh, if you ask me, the uh, ultimate reason for the financial defaults recently is very simple because of the high exposure of uh, and the very high leverage of the Chinese economy to property leverage in the past decades. And now is the time, seems to me, the time to pay back. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when the government started to deleverage this sector and to downplay the importance to economic growth, then we are seeing you know, the increasing number of defaults, uh, property-related defaults in China. The key moment was when the authorities in China announced a new three red lines policy to clamp down on excesses in the sector. Those three red lines, announced three years ago, said that liabilities shouldn't exceed 70% of assets, net debt shouldn't be greater than 100% of equity, and cash reserves must be at least 100% of short-term debt. And uh, once the uh, People's Bank of China started to uh, execute and enforce this policy back in 2021, then we apparently we've seen many property developers uh, started to face with some financial tension, first of all. Secondly, uh, related to that is the uh, zero COVID policy uh, back in 2022, you know, last year, that when there are significant reduction of property sales, now, after the free lines policy, many of the property projects could not be completed. And households or the buyers who put a down payment to the property project started to worry about oh, whether I can get back my apartment because I bought it. Uh, I put down my uh, pre-sales deposit. So it's also hurt the confidence of buyers. So when the free red lines policy or the financial tightening to property developers policy only pointed to uh, the supply side of the market we've seen in the past two or three years it started to gradually shift to become a, a demand side problem in china which means that right now many chinese households they don't have full confidence in property purchase anymore especially under the flagship policy of china which is common prosperity that uh, many people started to question whether real estate is a good investment vehicle or slimpy follow the government's uh, headline policy of housing is just for living. So I think when you ask me about these three red lines policies to start with is simply a financial uh, regulation imposed by the central bank on developers' leverage. And, and, and this was a right policy, you know, that, that time, but that point of time that uh, the central banks or the Chinese government uh, already see the high leverage of property developers, a form of systemic risk. And if they don't control it, they, if they don't tame the uh, leverage of these the builders, then eventually the bubble will get bigger and bigger. And that's why they enforce this. But the result and the adjustment um, uh, from this uh, tightening uh, is very painful. And it seems that now it's, if it becomes a, a demand side problem, then uh, that may not be the intended consequence of the original policy. ANZ's Chief Economist for Greater China, Raymond Jung there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Friday, August the 25th. Look out tonight for the big speeches from Jackson Hole from Christine Lagarde from the ECB and Jerome Powell from the Fed. We'll have all the aftermatch commentary on Monday morning. This podcast was recorded for publication on behalf of ANZ. All associated disclosures and disclaimers can be viewed using the link in your media player or the ANZ website through which you access this podcast. All care has been taken to report the views of ANZ Research in the creation of this podcast, but as an independent host, any differing interpretations are strictly mine and not ANZ's. Feel free to contact your ANZ point of contact with any questions.